Apostles, chapter 18. The Acts of the Apostles, chapter 18. We're going back to our series in the book of Acts. Having taken a break for the various activities that we've had at the beginning of the year, we, we go back and pick up the thread of studying and walking through this book of the Acts of the Apostles in our action series here. We study this book so that we may know how as a church we, God expects us to conduct ourselves and be the church that God would have us to be. And in the evening our companion study is in the book of 1 Corinthians which we'll be looking at this evening in chapter 15. And so we encourage you now to stand with us as we read from verse 1 of this text. Discussed part of this before, and so we were going to go over some of it so that we may be able to see what the Word of God says to us. Beginning at verse 1, according to the New King James Version, the scripture says here After these things, Paul departed from Athens and went to Corinth, and he found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to depart from Rome. And he came to them. So because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them and worked, for by occupation there were ten makers. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath from persuading both Jews and Greeks. When Silas and Timothy had come from Macedonia, Paul was compelled by the Spirit and testified that Jesus is the Christ. But when the opposed came and blasphemed, he shook his garments and said to them, Your blood be upon your own heads, I am clean. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. And he departed from there and entered the house of a certain man named Justice, one who worshipped God, whose house was next door to the synagogue. Then Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all his household, and many of the Corinthians came and believed and were baptized. And the Lord spoke to Paul in the night by a vision, Do not be afraid, but speak, and do not keep silent, for I am with you, and no one will attack you to hurt you, for I have many people in this city. And he continued there a year and six months, teaching the word of God among them. When Galileo was proconsul of Achaia, the Jews of one of our rose up against Paul and brought him to the judgment seat, saying, This fellow persuades men to worship God contrary to the law. When Paul was about to open his mouth, Galileo said to the Jews, If it were a matter of wrongdoing or wicked crimes, O Jews, there would be reason why I should bear with you. But if it be a question of words and names and your own law, look to it yourself. For I do not want to be a judge of such matters. And he drove them from the judgment seat. Then all the Greeks took Sosthenes, the ruler of the synagogue, and beat him. Then all the Greeks took Sosthenes, the ruler of the synagogue, and beat him before the judgment seat. But Galileo took no notice of these things. The word of the Lord. That's my hands in front. Father, we thank you for your wonderful word that is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. Now then, Lord God, form our mind. Shape, Lord God, our spirit. Reform our attitude. Redeem the time that we have. And Lord God, by your grace, help us to be resolved to proclaim this word under the governance of your Holy Spirit and even as you have dictated to us, may Lord God we do your wonderful will and serve this present age in the wonderful name of Jesus we pray. Let the people of God say, Amen. Please be seated. We welcome all those who view by way of YouTube, but we hope that you have been viewing uh, along with them. And we thank you for befriending us, liking us, and sharing with us. And we welcome your comments 
So we encourage you to continue in this series as we study the Word of God together. That we may grow in grace and in the knowledge of Christ. This morning, as we consider the continuing work of Paul and the missionary team sent up from Antioch, it is certain, and we need to be cognizant of the fact, that we function as a church, sharing and proclaiming the gospel under the overseeing hand and eyes of the Lord Jesus Christ. We are not left to do what we do according to our whims and according to our fancy. The church is not just functioning by circumstance, by happenstance. And it's not up to us whether we are pastors or apostles or prophets or teachers. In whatever capacity and position that we may occupy, the function just the way we see fit. We need to be aware that God Himself is looking on the key interest to ensure that His work is done just the way He has determined by His will. And there are times when it seems as though the direction in which the work is going is not perhaps the way we would prefer it to go, but we need to find comfort in the fact that the Lord Himself is overseeing His work and He is going to direct it where He would have it to go as long as we remain surrendered to His will. Here's Paul, here's Priscilla, here is Abel, Timotheus, and here also is Silas, men that are committed to sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. And they're going from city to city sharing this good news. And they do not know what they will encounter each time they go. They do not know how they're going to be received in the various cities where they go. They do not know what is going to be the outcome as they have carried out the work of God. But one thing that they can be certain of, and that is that the Lord Jesus Christ himself is overseeing the work and directing it all the way from heaven. And he's going to make sure that his kingdom is built just the way he did. So it does not matter how uncertain the times are. It does not matter what are the prevailing economic conditions. It does not matter what are the sociological factors that we have to combat. It does not even matter what cultural norms are mores that we uh, have to come up against as we carry out the work of God. We must find comfort in the fact that the Lord Jesus Christ himself is overseeing his work. And therefore, if we submit ourselves to him, then we'll be able to execute the mandate just as he determined. Just as he determined. All of us are here this morning not because we just wanted to sit in a quiet place, away from the noise and the battle in the crowd. But I dare to believe that all of us are here because we have a commitment to the cause of Jesus Christ. I dare to believe that all of us are here because we believe that the gospel is right. I dare to believe that we are here because we believe that it's important that the gospel of Christ be preached. I dare to believe that we are all here because we want to be strengthened, because we want to be enlightened, because we want to be edified and equipped and empowered that in our daily living and in our daily walk, we may be witnesses to the gospel of Jesus Christ and that we might have within us the ability to share God's word by the way we live and 
by the things we do and what we say so that the others outside of this congregation and others who are outside of the fall of Christ may come to him and to know him who to know in the life eternal. If that's true, you come on and say amen. amen. And therefore, since that is our commitment, it is important that as we execute it, that we know that we are being guided by the Lord Jesus Christ and He is overseeing His work with His personal care and attention. So that we are able then to execute the mandate of His commission just as He has determined. And when we look at this text this morning, we can see how the Lord gives direction and how that direction was executed in three specific ways under the leadership of Paul. First of all, you will see that as per usual, he goes into the synagogue of the Jews. But why Paul keep going into this synagogue? You see, well, that's where the word of God was constantly taught. That's where the Old Testament was known very well. And therefore, if there was ever a place uh, to be receptive of the fact that Jesus Christ is Messiah and he needs to bring that truth home, what a better place than the people who know the word of God to show them that the Messiah that they're looking for has come. His name is Jesus. And therefore, the scripture that they study every day, every week, has been fulfilled. That's the place to go. Think about it. If you have a product to sell, and there are people who are looking for this product, is it that your market? Is that your market? If you have a service to provide, and there are people who are constantly searching, looking, asking for that service, and they are as soon as it's available, they want it. Is it that the best people to go and prospect? Yes. What about the people who are saying that? What's it? What are you doing? It? What's that for? What's the good of that? You, you, your target market, as we say in the trade, are the people that have a need for your product or your service. The synagogue was the place where the word of God was preached, but was taught where there was exhortation, they were familiar with the scripture. So therefore it made sense to go to the Jews first. And then also to the others who were not aware. So into the synagogue, Paul went. There is a ready market. He can speak the word. He can, he, he can be given the opportunity to exhort and to teach. So he goes there first. But the scriptures tell us, but unfortunately, when he began to testify to the fact that the Jesus who they expect, and the Messiah who they're looking for, the Christ whom they're searching for is Jesus of Nazareth, they begin, the Bible says, to blaspheme. When you blaspheme, it means that even that you, you, you mitigate against the truth. You, you say slanderous things against the Holy Spirit and against God. You dismiss His word as nonsense and you try to dispense with it and to dissuade other people from believing it. They oppose Paul and blaspheme. So Paul did as Ezekiel was instructed. He shook his garments. He says, from now on, let me tell you. I ain't got nothing more to do with y'all. Not my fault. If you go to hell, it's your own fault. Because you heard the word of God. You heard the truth. And therefore, if you go to the place of eternal damnation, you condemn yourself. Amen. Amen. And so, notice very carefully that Paul then decided that he's going to go to those who were ignorant of the word of God. Those who were ignoble by their behavior. And those who were idolatrous in their practice. He made to the rest 
of the Corinthians. There he is in Corinth. People that worship idols. People whose character is sorry. And people who don't know much about God or about Christ. And so he goes to them. He didn't go very far because at least somebody in the congregation received his word. The chief ruler of the synagogue seemed to have believed Paul's word and his house was next door to the synagogue and he invited Paul and his crew to come and to set up shop there and people from the outside was now coming into Christmas's house so that he could share the message of God with them. Paul and Blanda could have been planned. It made sense. The synagogue is the place. But you see, when you are proclaiming the message and you're following the direction of God, you've got to let the Spirit of God that dictate the next step, determine what's the next move, point out what to do. When we as a church are going forth with the message, we've got to be open so that we allow God to work in our lives. He is the one that determines how and where and when and why. Are you open to God? See, sometimes as we minister, we have an idea in our minds how things are supposed to happen. We, we have a, a tradition and a practice, and there's nothing wrong with good tradition and good practice, as long as it's subject to the Spirit of God. Are you with me? So, look at how there's a turn of events. And from the religious house, Paul goes down to an ordinary house, and the word of God is being preached and taught there. But I want you to see, having given that background and that context, I want you to see now how heaven is paying attention to all of this. How, how heaven is aware of what's happening. You, you're not thrown in at the deep end when you're working for the Lord. You're not left on your own like a sheep in the wild. You need to know that even though we are sheep, Jesus said, Lord, I send you forth as sheep among those. And because he know that we are sheep among those, he is directing us in our various ways so that the ministry that he wants conveyed is done appropriately. Are you with me here this morning? Paul is probably wondering what's going to happen. Paul is probably concerned what's going to happen. Next door just kicked him out and they're blaspheming and he's right next door to the opposition. He's right next to the heat. He's right next to those, to the haters, to those who, who, who don't have any regard for the message. It's a little disconcerting, isn't it? When you are speaking the truth and when you're trying your best to convince people of what is good and what is right, that they oppose you and not only oppose you, but they do it in the most despicable way. It makes many a person step back, but you need to know that God is in control. You just need to follow the mandate so that you can execute that commission. Notice, the Bible says there, look with me now, that as Paul is doing what he's doing, in verse 9, the Lord appears to him by night in a vision. Do you see that? Do you see that? It didn't say an angel spoke to Paul. It didn't say that Aquila and Priscilla said, Paul, you know, you look a little discouraged. Paul, I, I think we should keep pressing. Timothy and Silas, they said, but Paul, uh, things not going as you think it should go, so maybe you can, you know, don't, don't lose faith. Let's, let's keep trying. The, the, the encouragement did not come from his peers. The encouragement did not come even as David's encouragement comes when the Bible says he encouraged himself in the Lord. Paul didn't even go in prayer 
and that God assured him something, the Bible says the Lord spoke to Paul in night, in the night by a vision. The Lord himself. Jesus, who is on the right hand of the Father, is watching to make sure of what he has commissioned the church to do comes to pass. And that happens in every church, in every assembly, in every country, wherever the word of God is being preached. God is concerned and Jesus is paying personal attention to what we do to ensure that the gospel gets to where it needs to get. God is building a kingdom. Anybody know that? The Lord himself appeared to Paul. And look at what he said. Don't be afraid. There was not reason to be afraid. It wasn't long ago in the last time that Paul was stoned. And when the, the stone, it didn't mean that somebody threw rocks at him and he ran. It means that he was plummeted with stones until he was unconscious on the floor. Left today. He says to him, don't be afraid. There are times because of our work in the gospel. There are times because of our ministry and our preaching and our stance and position that you, you come on the attack. It causes you feel discouraged and despondent. Sink into despair. You want to step back from doing what you're supposed to do. Jesus said to him, Paul, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Then he says to him, speak. Are you hearing me? Speak. If there's ever time for the church to speak, that time is now. We're getting all kinds of confused statements in the press every day from our government. As we live in this country, we don't know which side is up. All we know that there are problems and they're increasing. And we're looking constantly for someone to say, this is the path to which we will get out of this morass. This is the way by which the country will recover from its economic world. This is the clear direction that we will go and they're enumerating it and showing you so that when you see it, you can say, that seems to be logical and reasonable and rational and we ought to give our support. One minister says this, another says that. One, then the cabinet says this, and the prime minister says that. The press says this, and the, and the talk show says this. There are all kinds of, of confusing signals in the land. If there's ever time for the church to speak with clarity, the time is I attended the ministry of Family Heart Ministry just last Sunday evening. I encourage all of you to do the same. And I saw some of you there, praise the Lord. But here's a ministry that stood up with the slogan, Stand Straight in the Marriage Gate. And every one of those words is saying something. Stand, stand straight. Don't be bent, don't be twisted, don't be perverted in any respect. Stand straight. And stand straight where? In the let the foundational truth of God's word, let what God has established to be at the root of every community and country be what we are committed to and not the new agendas of the world. And I admire and support Dr. Hainsby Griffin who stood up with strident voice on equivocally and declare that as a church and as a Christian community, we are committed to marriage between one man and one woman, and that the mandate of God must be executed. He spoke with authority. Jesus said to Paul, Don't be afraid, speak. Where's yes. that supposed to be done? I don't mean dumb by stupid, I mean dumb by being you think. Speak. Don't allow yourself to be intimidated because of the circumstances around you, because of the opposition you face. Speak. And do not keep silence. Notice he 
is emphatic. Don't be afraid to speak. Don't be silent. Don't be dumb. Don't be looking. Don't allow anybody to stop you from proclaiming the gospel I give you. In other words, my point number one to you is that Paul was commanded to continue preaching the gospel by the Lord Himself. And He says, I'm with you. I'm with you. That's where our strength is. Our strength is not in our determination. Our strength is not in mere human commitment. Our strength is not in our tradition. Our strength is not in uh, the, the style of church we have. Our strength is not in our program. Our strength is in the fact that what we're doing is commanded by Jesus. And He is with us. He's with you on your job. When you take a stand for God. He's with you in your home. When you declare what will happen in your house. He's with you when you're with your friends. He's with you in your chat rooms. He's with you when you're Facebook. He's with you on your blogs. He's with you in your tweets. He's with you in your texting. He's with you in your attitudes. He's with you. And you need to have uh, the confidence that you can preach this word because he says, I am with you. With you. No one is going to attack you, to hurt you. And listen to this. This is the piece that got me a little excited. He says, because I have many people in this city. Not only is the Lord Jesus Christ aware of the efforts of the church, he's also aware of the people who need to be saved by the church. You may not be able to see them. I can't walk and see a man come people and say, oh, don't be saved. Oh, that one's going to hell. Oh, dear Lord. Oh, she's going to heaven. But, oh, good Lord. He better repent now. Uh, we, we, we don't go down the street and see people and identify them by that way. We don't have the ability and the foresight to act to grab. Because you might be uncomfortable when you go to certain places to worship. You may have to stop listening to some preachers. You may have to turn off some programs on TV. You may have to stop sending your money to support certain groups. Because you uh, will be surprised that that ministry was never about Jesus. God has withheld that information from us. That memo does not come into our inbox. But what has come clearly is that he commands us to preach the word of God. And not as Paul is preaching to the ignorant, the ignoble, and the idolaters, but yet God says, the Lord says, I have many people in this city. There's some people in the city that Jesus has already marked to be saved. There's some people in the city that God is working on them. His Holy Spirit is active in their lives. It don't look so to you. It don't feel so to you. You feel as though my God, the whole world is going to hell in a handbasket. And I don't even know if I should bother preaching. But you need to know that's the command Jesus said. Don't be afraid. Don't be silent. Speak. Because I'm with you. And I have a lot of people in this city. Some people in this city that God won't save. And our job is to follow the mandate of the Lord who's looking from heaven and overseeing his work. And so, listen carefully now. Secondly, uh, the other mandate that we need to follow from the Lord to execute his commission is that Paul, the scriptures say in verse 11, continue there a year and a half. He continued. He continued. It's not like when the Lord speak to you and gave you the encouragement that you need. It causes you to know that you ought to continue. Sometimes you're speaking to people and it seems as though the more you preach, the worse they get. Anybody have that experience? Sometimes you're talking to your child and the more you're encouraging them to stay
It's in the door you're standing by yourself. It's in the door you are all alone. But let me tell you, my brothers and my sisters, the church needs to continue. Continue to preach. Continue to teach. Continue to share the gospel. Continue to work. Because the Lord got a lot of people in the city that he needs to win. Continue. The Bible says in the preceding verses here that many Corinthians begin to believe the message of God. Not a few, many. They're in that house church. They're in the church at the side of the synagogue. Right there, many people begin to believe the word of God. Many, including the head of the synagogue. Huh? We dare not stop. We dare not close the church. We dare not get tired. We dare not get uh, uh, persuaded to, to do all kinds of nice, cute, fuzzy things to adopt ourselves to uh, the community. We dare not try to get uh, all, all, all you know, uh, innovating and try to get feel good stuff. We dare not allow ourselves uh, to do like some churches in the United States uh, where there is just, uh, we become friendly, you know, we, we are seeker friendly. And so we, we put coffee in, in, in the foyer and we put donuts in the foyer so that people can just come and sit in the church and feel comfortable. We dare not lower our standards so that they can come if they're on the way to the beach and they can wear the beach clothes and then when they're ready after church they can go on to the beach and stop by here for a little bit. We, we dare not try to lower our standards. All we need to do is to continue. Continue. Continue to sing the praises of God. Continue to preach the word of God. Continue to teach the principles of God. Continue to take a stand for Christ. Continue with the gospel of Jesus. Paul said it here in the hand. And many of the Corinthians believe on the Lord and were baptized. That shows their commitment. That shows that they, they were marrying. That shows that they were buying into it. That shows they were consecrating themselves. That shows they were dedicating themselves. That shows that they were seeking to be cleansed of their sins and to follow God completely. Thirdly, We consider this mandate that heaven directs that we may successfully execute his commission. We need to be aware that as we follow the command of God, as we continue, as he has directed us, it will oftentimes be contrary, contrary to the status quo of many. So the contrary, Christians need to understand that we have to stop waiting for the world to fall in love with you. <laughs> Somehow, we are being duped by the enemy that there is in the society a place called normal. It's somewhere between extraordinary and horrible. There's a place called normal. We, we, we keep searching to be ordinary. We keep striving to be average. We keep trying as human beings to be like everybody else. We keep wanting to fit in. We keep wanting to belong. We keep wanting to be accepted. The psychologists and the sociologists tell us about the importance of that in our formative years. Our young people are often beset by various stresses when they don't feel accepted by their parents. When they don't think that they fit in and they belong. And then they begin to do all kinds of interesting things so that they can. Huh? I don't have to tell you, 
know what your children do. They want to wear clothes that everybody else wear. They want to dress like everybody else. They want to speak like everybody else. What do they tell you? All right, in the United States, that we're copying car blanche, even though it's not often relevant to suiting. What we want to do, we want to be down. We want to be down with the crew and down with the posse. We want to be like that, you know, we want to be just down. We want to take it and keep it real. <laughs> Why? You got to be down. Why can't you say I'm going to be? Oh no, we want to be down. Be down with the crew. And so, bright children, intelligent children, stop working hard. Stop doing homework. Stop listening to you. Don't want to go to lessons because they want to be. Yeah. Because being smart is so good. Because when you're smart, you are different than everybody else. You are cut above the. But you don't want to be above. You want to be. Yeah. <laughs> so we got to pull our blouses down the shore or cleavage, or we got to. Have integrity. They look special. 
I'm sorry. It's not special to be a Christian. You are just beginning to live. And therefore, as we preach the word of God, teach the word of God, live out the word of God, we are going to come up against what is contrary to it. Are you hearing me today? And we can't allow ourselves to be discouraged because there are things and there are people who will be contrary to the mandate every day. Expect it. Stop whining. Take your finger out your mouth. Stop complaining. Stop being upset. Stop allowing the enemy to get you all on set and on the sick because something happened that was contrary. <coughs> Well, look at what's contrary here now. The Jews didn't quit. Then they saw the success of Paul and Silas and his team. And their chief of their synagogue joined Paul and giving him audience in his house and even got baptized. Lord have mercy, we came a person. They got mad, they got upset. You need to know there's going to be some blowback to every person that you win from the drug den. There's going to be some blowback to every person that you bring out of the brothels. There's going to be some blowback to every person that you bring from sin. There's going to be a blowback to every person that you bring into the house of God. And they begin to lead lifestyles that are wrong and perverted and sinful. There's going to be a blowback to every person who was an adulterer before and break off those relationships and begin to live holy with his wife. There's going to be some blowback to every person who said, Stop being a public killer and I'm going to give up my lovers and start serving Jesus Christ. There's going to be some blowback to that. People are going to see that you're this, that you're contrary to what's happening around them. It's going to cause some problems. And therefore, they came and got Paul and walked into Galileo, the proconsul, and complained and laid allegations to him. And listen to the allegations. These people are preaching contrary to the law. They're telling the people, don't go to the temples and worship the idols no more. You know that can affect our economy. When people go to the temples, they patronize the temples. All the little artifacts and the idols that are sold, they're messing things up. The train is going to run here. These people are telling people, that a man can't have his wife, can't sleep with the girls at the temple. You know what Corinthians be do that? And can't even sleep with his servant girls? Hey, that's what we do. I can't even sleep with the boy that he has as his servant boy. They're teaching all kinds of strange things here. Contrary to the law. This is some strange doctrine. We don't let them do something with them. Please, the people that will complain about you. Oh, let me tell you, don't sit here, don't sit here in this congregation and don't know that there are people who have already scanned who's going to stand up on the job. They know who's going to speak out against Trump. They know who is going to stand up for the truth. They know who's going to embezzle the money or who will report the embezzler. They already know if they try to introduce a law, who's going to protest? They already know the churches that are going to march in the street. They already have you on the short list because of your stance for Jesus Christ because it's going to be contrary to their law. But the Lord said, I've got a lot of people in this world. The proconsul Galileo listened to them. And he said, Listen, Jews, we tell you also. If this was a matter of wrong that was done, if this was a matter of wickedness that was done, if this was a matter of lewdness, I would entertain you. But since this seems to be only stuff that is opposed to you and your way of living, I don't want to hear it. There's some judges that 